welcome to the seventh episode of History Bites in 2022. My name is Dawn Owen and I'm the curator at Guelph Museums. History Bites is a one hour, casu one hour long casual conversation during which we chat about the latest news, exhibitions and events and other happenings at Guelph Museums. History, History Bites airs on Guelph Museum's Facebook Live every month. A recording of today's program will be available through the Museum Everywhere portal on our website and on our socials after the broadcast. I am recording today's program in Guelph, Ontario. Before I introduce and welcome our guests, I'd like to focus our thoughts within an awareness and acknowledgement of the land. Guelph is located on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabeg peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The place we now call Guelph is on land that is described in the Between the Lakes Purchase Number no. 3 Treaty of 1792, an agreement between the Mississaugas of the Credit and the British Crown concerning over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario, and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to doing more to learn, share and support truth and healing. When we gather, we spend time in conversation about the land, its history and its peoples. We grow our knowledge and our relationships with our treaty partner, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and with the many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples who call Guelph home today. This informs all that we do at the museum and underscores our commitment to each other today and to, for the health and well-being of future generations. Today I'm in conversation with our community uh, partners and storytellers. I, I say the creative geniuses behind Moving History's Neighbourhood Mysteries, a multi-year collaboration in three vibrant neighbourhoods Two Rivers, Onward Willow, and Brant Avenue. Moving Histories is a partnership between Guelph Museums and the Guelph Film Festival with key support from the Guelph Neighborhood Support Coalition and CFRU 93.3 FM and funded in part by a grant from the Guelph Community Foundation Musigetti's Fund. Launched in 2018, the project hosted actual and virtual bus tours in the neighborhoods, guided by intergenerational storytellers and led by community story advocate Jenny Mitchell. The tours were filmed and footage produced as three short docs, capturing the storytellers who shared their memories, lived perspectives and personal anecdotes in the places they call home. The films are on view now at the Guelph Civic Museum in the exhibition Moving Histories, Neighborhood Mysteries. The exhibition recognizes the power of film and storytelling and includes images and artifacts about each neighborhood uh, and, and shares uh, Guelph's local film history. On History Bites today, I'm joined by five of the community storytellers, two film directors, the lead artist on the project and a neighborhood developer. Um, you'll soon hear introductions to all of my guests today, um, but you'll and you'll soon see that they are so many more things than what I've just described and I'm super thrilled to have everybody join us today in this conversation. Um, I'm going to start with uh, introductions and, and you're first on my list, Jenny. Jenny Mitchell is a Guelph-based multidisciplinary artist specializing in drawing, silk screening, and story storytelling. She was the City of Guelph's artist in residence in 2020 with her project Golden Guelph, and she operates the Golden Bus, a mobile collaborative art space. Jenny is currently the volunteer and mobile studio coordinator for CFRU, performs music as Bird City and Jenny Omnicord, and for Moving Histories, Neighborhood Mysteries, Jenny was responsible for finding diverse intergenerational residents of Guelph to be our storytellers to tell the history of these three Guelph neighborhoods. Welcome, Jenny. Thanks so much for joining us in History Bites. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Okay, now I'm delighted to introduce you to Tia Carey Wong. 
Tia is studying uh, art history at the University of Ottawa, and this summer she is working as Programs and Events Assistant at McRae House. She is an enthusiastic music explorer, learner of languages, and watcher of food-themed Netflix docu-series. I'm totally going to have to get some recs from you off the call, Tia, another time. Uh, but welcome to History Bites. So happy you could join us. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> And over to you, Dana. Dana Nutley is a father of six, a lifelong resident of the Onward Willow neighborhood. Uh, he has been uh, doing advocacy work for over 20 years for numerous causes, including oral health, uh, murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and two-spirit peoples, food insecurity and disability issues, among others. Welcome, uh, Dana. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, thanks for having me. Um... I'm excited to see uh, where this goes. Me too. <laughs> we'll get there in a moment. Um, next, I'm very delighted to welcome Amal Saleh uh, to History Bites. Amal is a youth worker for Sheldell Family Gateway uh, who grew up in the Onward Willow community. She strives to bring awareness and change for underserved communities through her work and sharing her story. Welcome, Amal. Thanks for joining us in History Bites. Hi guys, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and to share our experiences. Lovely, thanks, Samuel. And I'm now delighted to welcome Kavya Yoganathan. Kavya is a filmmaker, photographer, arts-based facilitator, and founder of Leaders of Today, a program through which she works to create space for youth community building through arts-based storytelling. Welcome, Kavya. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy to be here in, in conversation with all of you amazing people. Thank you. Here, here. <laughs> um, and I am now going to introduce Isabella and Michael, who are sharing a, a space and also sharing a screen. So I'll introduce you both at the same time, and then you can uh, join in and, sit and, and share your hellos. So Isabella Lukomska is a lo longtime community advocate involved with the uh, Guelph Neighborhood Support Coalition, Guelph Community Health Center, and more specifically in the Brant neighborhood. She is a coordinator of the Brant Community Garden, a fruit smoothie and veg burger server at community events, and a mom of two awesome daughters. Mm -hmm. And Michael Lewis has been instrumental in making the Brant Community Garden what it is now, an oasis for humans and other animals. He is a grassroots reggae mu musician, an avid cook of plants, and a passionate advocate for well-being. Welcome, Isabella and Michael. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, and now over to Kimber Sider. Kimber is the artistic director of the Guelph Film Festival, as well as being an academic documentary filmmaker and a weird naturey person who digs, I emphasized weird, <laughs> who digs community building and storytelling. Welcome, Kimber. So delighted to have you uh, join us today in, in conversation. I'm very excited to be here with everybody and to hear more from our storytellers and more about, uh, yeah, everybody's perspectives. Fantastic. And last but most certainly not least, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Dan Evans uh, to, the, to the conversation. Dan is a documentary storytelling fan and a community developer development worker at a charity called the Guelph Neighborhood Support Coalition. You've heard that uh, me say that, uh, refer to that group a few times already today uh, and more to come. Uh, welcome, Dan, to History Bites. Thanks so much, Don and everyone. I'm just riding sidecar, marveling at all of your stories and abilities. Thanks for letting me join. Thanks for being here. Um, what an absolute pleasure to welcome you all to the program. Um, and I'm, I, like everyone has expressed, I'm also super excited to get just get it right into our conversation today. Um, my first question really gets at the heart of what Moving Histories, Neighborhood Mysteries, that's sort of um, what that project is, what it has been all, all along in terms of its long journey. Um, and so the question is, is, I guess, rather simply this, what makes a place home? Who would like to start us off by sharing some thoughts about what home? Makes a place home? 
Um, I would say what makes a place home where you feel you feel comfortable living there and relaxed and you know and the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would say the connections that we have to people to make a place home. Um just just random things that that you know and make you feel like you're somewhere where you belong? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, it's, uh home is one of the you know is full of sort of the intangible things i know oftentimes in the museum when we think about place for example we're often orienting our thoughts around built structures environments um sort of they're framed by the things that we create as a community but i think there's so much more to home than place i would suggest and i wonder if that um resonates with and if the any of the other uh, sure. storytellers on the call, Jenny, go ahead. Yeah, I think that um, just I was trying to think of this question outside of space, like you're mentioning, and I think anywhere that I feel welcomed and supported beyond just me, like where I don't have to find everything or advocate or fight for everything myself, anywhere where I can show up and there's more resources, whether that's people um, or the space or both, I think that that's, what, that's when I feel at home. So even if I'm on tour or somewhere in a different city, I can find home in those spaces if there's sort of that community and that organic support at the table. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Dan. I might jump in there because I, I I also um I was thinking in the context of the title the mysteries part I love the mystery part in the title of this project and you know I, I I think it's important that we list places and relationships land and we list all of those things that that make a a, a home home but I think if we invest in the mysteries part you know the vibes that you can read or that you can be um, you know, wafting with or against in a, in a neighborhood or in a home, I think that sometimes those concrete and tangible things don't matter. Like it's, it's um, you know, the unsayable stuff or the, the little challenges, maybe challenges of navigation through a physical space bring, bring sense of home to me. Like, oh, I need to find the secrets of this place out. And that's, that's an impulse I carry in my own backyard, in my own neighborhood. What are the secrets that are underneath the, the sort of pleasantries that are underneath the, the yew bushes, you know, that are, that are underneath the, 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 the niceties, which are all important. But, um, you know, when you try to go a bit deeper, it's, it's through channeling and investigating those mysteries. And that's one of the things I, I look for in home, but also love about this project. Yeah, so I, one of the things that what you just shared, Dan, um, triggered for me is as I've been sort of, um, I, I'm, I'm the one on the call and maybe a little bit Tia, because she works in the museum now too, um, who gets to sort of revisit uh, the films and the exhibition sort of with regularity and sort of witness people coming in and out of the space and sort of spending different amounts of time in, di in different kinds of focus on on aspects of the of the exhibition and of course of the films themselves and one of the things that um, I've been thinking a lot about is that mystery side of it and for me Dan one of the things that um, sort of surfaces a lot is just like all of the other stories that even though we've got so many amazing stories in the films and in the exhibition there's so many more that are not in that space that sort of people carry with them into that experience um, that they sometimes share if given an opportunity if in dialogue with, with with one of the team here in the museum or just quietly amongst the people like amongst the group that is visiting together um, and then they walk away and they carry sort of those stories with them all the time and so for me I think one of the things that I think a lot about in terms of home and sort of how this exhibition is um, is being experienced is just um, sort of that story making and the awareness um, that we all are, are carriers of story and we carry those story, maybe Jenny, this gets to your point, into other spaces that we spend some time in. Um, does that resonate for this group in the context of sort of home and place? Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I will, go ahead, Dana. 
I think it's safety and 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 security. Um, I've so my bio said lifelong resident of Onward Willow, and I mean I've lived in other neighborhoods and I've tried to make it home, but I don't know. Uh, there's something about the Onward Willow neighborhood and me. It's it's like a magnet. It, it's um. Not that I don't feel safe and secure elsewhere, but Onward Willow to me is like that that warm, all-encompassing blanket, right? Um, it gets a bad rap by everybody else, but um, I don't feel scared in this neighborhood. There's like, uh, I don't know. It, uh, and I think home, I mean, home is what you make it, but I mean, I've also been in places where it just, you know, didn't feel like home even after two or three years of trying and it's just always coming back to where my roots are I guess maybe that's it home is where you set down roots um and you always end up going back to those roots right because your roots are what nurtured you in the beginning so you go back um so yeah I mean it's the security I think um of having a place that you've been that you can call your own Thanks so much, Dana. I think Tia, you had a thought, and of course, Kavya, I don't want to forget that you were jump, about to jump in as well. Shall we start with Tia? Sure, yeah. Um, I had the exact, I literally, I wrote this down, Dana. I wrote down safety as well, because I had the exact same thought. And I even, I was thinking about how, like, the, the combination of, like, familiarity with places in your surroundings of your home and, like, trying to incorporate yourself into like a network of people leads to that like safety net and that's where all the mysteries are but so I recently moved out of Guelph and <laughs> I'm, I'm in Ottawa now and it's very different because in Guelph when things are happening it's like you you just know once you have that little network established, you know everything that's going on. And in Ottawa, it's like, I don't know what's happening unless I seek it out. So I did a lot of walking around and just orienting myself in the area and, and meeting as many of my neighbors as I could, <laughs> just so that I could situate myself within all these different reference points. <laughs> and otherwise, I would have no idea what was going on. <laughs> And it's so awesome, Tia, that you're back in Guelph for the summer um, and that you're spending some time with us here in the museum as well. Um, Kavya, did you want to rejoin? You had a thought bubble earlier. I did. And 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 um, I'm actually glad that you went first, Anna, because I, I think you said a lot of um, what I have been feeling. And I'm, I'm one of the many kids that um, have immigrated to Guelph and grew up in the Onward Willow neighborhood as it's populated with uh, immigrant kids. Um, and so I think having moved around to so many places and, and as many people's immigrant journeys are, that you don't just arrive in one place, you go to so many different places before you arrive here. And I think for me, I, um, the reason why I think my family and and both my family and myself are so drawn to Guelph is and and not just Guelph but but the Onward Willow neighborhood specifically because I've grown up in this neighborhood and then I went away for school and then like a magnet it like drew me back to this neighborhood and I can't imagine living in this city and not living in this in this neighborhood I just feel like um, my people are here. Um, and I think for me, the I, I've never felt safety was a huge thing for me growing up, um, having moved um, from my home country because of a lack of safety um, and seeking out safety to come to this city and this neighborhood and to feel that sense of safety in community and i and i think i credit a lot of that feeling of safety to the people in that neighborhood um these are the like the moms who raise the babies who aren't their own who look out for us when we're out in the neighborhood who always keep an eye on us and for you know the community workers uh like dana and amal who you know through shelldale and the programming there kept us out of trouble and you know gave us a place to go when when we didn't 
have access to a lot of different things and but but made us feel like we were a part of community um and so i think that um has always drawn me to to this neighborhood is that no matter where and and what i love about the onward willow neighborhood is that so many of us are from everywhere um and and yet there is this feeling that no matter where you are from if you're in that neighborhood your family and it's that sense of family that i have never felt that sense of safety and it's it was always interesting and and odd to me when i would hear people talk about oh it's a dangerous neighborhood and i it would baffle me because i've never in my life felt more safe in any other space other than the onward willow neighborhood and and i think um in in many ways i i am who i am today because of the love and support that neighborhood showed me and 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 i'm an example of what it looks like when a community really comes together to raise raise their their kids in that neighborhood um and so i think um that word home has really been shaped for me by the people in in that neighborhood emil please yes jump in um I'm glad to be like almost one of the last people to speak because um, everyone just like everything that everyone said resonated with me. And I do have like a few notes myself, but um, definitely like the moving around was like a big thing um, for my family as well. And um, for, uh, I came from the United States actually. So I've been in Canada most of my life, but um, my mom immigrated to the United States and not to maybe the greatest neighborhood in the United States. And so she was told to, come here and we moved around quite a bit all around Canada and the only place that has managed to keep my mother in one place is the Honor Willow community. Um, even when I left to go to college um, I couldn't even stand being in Toronto for six months. I had to come back and I commuted. I was like I'd rather wake up at five in the morning and commute to Toronto every day than to be living there. Um, I, Toronto's a beautiful city um, but this was my home and this is where um, I like made friendships, long lasting friendships. And um, someone said something about uh, like accessing resources. Like I think the honored little community, it's like anyone can come and someone is there to help you and whatever it is you need. And so I think that um, that's, that really like feels like home to me. And um, the family aspect, um, as Kavya said, um, I think you can walk into Honored Willow or the Sheldell Center and any person who has accessed any one of those resources will tell you it feels like a family. And so um, I think it's beautiful. I think um, it's so diverse, it's so inclusive and, um, and people just have a hard time leaving after. Like we just love it. And I think the people who live within the community or who have um, been in the community for a long time, um, I think they see it in a different light than um, other neighborhoods, maybe in Guelph or in other cities, um, like Dana said. And um, but we don't see it. Like we're, we're so like oblivious. <laughs> I was so oblivious to it. I didn't even know that these um, stigmas were um, attached to this neighborhood until I became a teenager adult. Um, and then when I realized it, I said, that's that's ridiculous, right? And so that's when that advocacy kind of started and I was like, I mean, I ha we have to change this. And um, Dana, um, as a child, like Dana was the one that was, you know, in the center and we would go to him and he'd be at all the events and everything. And so um, Dana, I just wanted to thank you for like doing that for us. Um, I actually just came across uh, some, a book and it has some old photographs of when the Shadow Center was built. And so, um, I was going through it and I was like, wow, well, like what amazing memories. These bookshelves behind me, those are from the very first, um, when they first created um, the Shaldell Center and it was built by um, the volunteers at Honored Willow and they're still here. And so they have a story behind it and they haven't been, <laughs> they haven't been like touched or anything. They've been moved, but yeah. Thanks so much, Amal. I, I um, the museum curator in me, is is like uh, very enthusiastically saying, oh my golly, there's so many stories living in those cabinets behind you that you just gave us a little bit of a glimpse of. And I think to myself, can I, yeah, well, maybe we have a future conversation 
uh, if you're willing to have it. Uh, you don't have to commit here, but I think that there's a lot we can do together to make sure that those stories are part of our larger uh, catalog of stories that we share here through the museum. Dana, you just put up your hand. Yeah, um, just a small story. Those cabinets were like one of the first community advocacy things that Sheldale did. We, uh, a group of kids that were at risk actually built them, painted them. And uh, so, yeah, um, just a interesting bit to go with the, the story behind the, the things behind Animal there. And we have the pictures, which is amazing. We just found them when we were renovating. So um, Dana, I don't know if you've seen the book, uh, black and white photos. Um, I will bring them by to you to look at. Um, they're amazing. I wasn't here when they were being built, obviously, but um, everyone in the center was like super excited about it. So it was a nice find. <laughs> um, yeah, it's tip of the iceberg, right? I think is what we're really talking about here. The stories that we're going to share to each other in this space and, and the me memories that some of us on this call have had and built together over time. Um, it sort of gives me a natural opportunity to sort of move into the next um, thought piece that I would love to uh, sort of pose as a question to everybody today. Um, so the question is, how does change shape a neighborhood over time? And I'd really like to encourage you to think about change in a really fluid way, whatever that means to you, um, whatever the shaping side of that question also means to you in the context of sort of how a neighborhood becomes a neighborhood uh, beyond its streetscape. Um, so how does change shape a neighborhood over time? Dana? Um. Yeah, so change. Um, as, as somebody who grew up here, um, I was like super, super resistant to change when they were uh, announced that uh, they were going to open the Better Beginnings, Better Futures. Um, it was fun in the beginning before they had um, any real overhead, right? Because there was a lot of money and there was a lot of stuff people could do. Um, but yeah, when they were going to move into the school, I was like, um, almost protesting against it, right? They were, they wanted to bring police and children's aid into a neighborhood that, um, and public health that typically had negative experiences with all three of those organizations. And I'm like, you can't do that. Um, and lo and behold, um, I think that change ultimately, um, because it was positive is what ended up shaping the Armored Willow neighborhood um, to what it is today. Um, so, you know, change can be good if it's in a positive way, but um, uh, there's a few changes that have been announced that they want to make in the Armored Willow neighborhood. And I'm afraid that those changes are starting to move towards gentrification. Mm -hmm. And um, once that happens, that will take, um, you know, that, that can take neighborhoods um, and, and lose the entire sense of community. Um, uh, I'm not, I don't live down there, but I look at the ward in particular, right? There's a, there's a lot of stuff being built down there and it's like, whoa, that's not the old, um, yeah. I had a sister who married a family who lived on, he married into a family that lived on, the, on Alice Street. So I was very familiar with the ward growing up as well. And driving down there, I'm like, whoa, this just, I don't get that same feel that I once had driving through the ward, right? Now I'm not a resident there, so, and I'm sure other people feel the same way driving through other parts of the city that, you know, some of the changes you look at and go, that's cool, that's neat. And other ones you look at and go, mm, you know, uh, the, you see the beginnings of um, just gentrification and, and you just, uh, yeah, that's just something that, that you don't want, right? You don't want to lose those, that, that family feel that I was talking about earlier. Thanks so much for that, Dana. Um, I wondered if I know both Isabella and Michael, you talked about uh, quite a lot in your film about ideas around change, observations that you had made, changes that were proposed or maybe had happened in the Brant neighborhood. Um, I wondered if you could share some of that perspective um, in this conversation today. 
I think maybe we were talking about the green space that we so love. Um, that green space is now brown space, unfortunately, and some houses have been built already in areas where there were apple trees and yeah, um, sometimes change is hard to come to terms with. And especially now when we should um, hold up nature in its, all its forms, because we're understanding that we are natural beings and we're part of nature. And if we take ourselves out of it, 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 spells, it may spell trouble for us. So um, that's, that's maybe the change that we're not welcoming, but there are other changes that we are to, to kind of offset it a little bit. Um, there are neighbors who move out, so that's kind of sad too, and we stay in touch with them. There are children who grow up, grow up into young adults, um, and there's the growth of us. So there's another project that we're doing with the GNST Values team, and we're talking about growth together, growing together. And that's a change as well. So like the obvious thing of growth is our community garden, but then that garden has grown us in so many ways as a community. So that, that's a positive change, I would say. Would you agree? Yeah, and uh, sometimes changes can be good too. It all depends on how we look at it, eh? you know? Right. Well, I, I think um, I think change is happening. It's never. I mean, I think our 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 lives don't stay the same day over day. No. I think that you know change is a constant. But um, but there are big moments of change. Change that. Um, both Isabella and Michael, you and also Dana referred to in terms of the things that are sort of imposing change on the places we call home um, and sort of, you know, where we sit as as human animals in the mix of all of that, all the all of the change that's happening around us. Um, it's really interesting me to me to sort of hear you um, you all sort of reflect on what that means, because I think initially, um, you know, as you so um, perfectly described, sometimes change happens and we don't perceive the richness or the possibility of that change in the moment that's happening. Other times we see it for what it is and maybe it is a kind of change that actually, you know, hasn't been the best for a particular place. Um, and the ways in which I, maybe I'll phrase it this way, the, the resilience is within the community that is experiencing that change, then, you know, shapes sort of the value set around that change relationship. Um, Jenny, like, sorry, go like ahead. Kind of like a grain of sand in a muscle, then it becomes a pearl. At first, it's an irritation, but then everyone gathers and brings their best selves forward. And that, I think maybe you were alluding to that. I love that. I love that relationship. Um, and also sort of the piece of it, which is the caring side of it, right? So what we do as, as sort of human animals is we, we, we are trying to exercise care in the places that mean a lot to us, right? So how we define community, how we define home, what is our role to play in sort of the caring of that of that place, um, particularly in moments of, of change or, or, or tension or struggle. Um, Jenny, I saw you put your hand up as we were sort of in the midst of, of, of our chatter. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to point out of the three neighborhoods, to me, Willow was the one that had the most like uh, talking about histories that you couldn't see. So referring to spaces that were gone, um, Grant had a few of those. Uh, I think of the three, the ward or two rivers has probably been the best at preserving some of the facades, at least of some of the spaces, even if the thing has changed. But what was so striking about Willow is because we had storytellers that were lifelong residents, they didn't need the visual to know where the stuff had gone, you know, or to know the significance of the history. So I think that one thing we lose is when the change is so rapid and people no longer feel like it's home and they all disperse. If you don't have those intergenerational or those long lifelong people who have kept a tether to where the things have gone, then you lose kind of all of that sense of the, the safety, the resources, the community and everything. And so I think that change is natural, but ideally you still have people who 
are living there and committing to being there, keeping track of the changes and recognizing the value of what came before and why the change happened and even potentially the potential of the new things coming in. So when I see somewhere like the Two Rivers neighborhood and the Con, like lots and lots and lots of buildings going up. The idea of new residents doesn't scare me, but the idea of displacing the people who've been there for a long time who carry those histories definitely does. So new people joining the story and building on community is amazing. And well, um, I would open my arms to all the new residents, but I do hope that that can happen with enough people sticking around to sort of introduce those folks to how things are and, and that the long-term residents aren't totally resistant to change, that they also open themselves to things being different as we go forward. But I think it's the rapid change combined with displacement that is like the bad type of, of impact on a neighborhood in my experience. Emil, please jump in. Yeah, I was just gonna add to Jenny's um, comment. Um, I agree that like the rapidness and stuff like that really does uh, affect um, how accepting the community will be to change, um, as well as not having like community involvement. Um, I think sometimes a lot of people who don't live within certain neighborhoods are making the decisions as to what the neighborhood needs or what's going to be um, created within that neighborhood that they wouldn't create for their own neighborhoods right so it's like you if you're, you're expecting a neighborhood to accept something that you don't wouldn't even put or change within your own and so um i think that causes like a lot of resilience um and you know nobody wants to hear um what's happening through like a third party right like it, it's about communication being open and honest um about changes that are coming um the struggles that we're going through. Um, Honor Willow has always been a community that um, when we had any issues, we'd always speak on it. And we would always, um, you know, talk about our feelings and how we feel about certain things. And um, I, I just have noticed lately, like that's not really been happening because other people are making decisions for this community mm -hmm. um, that don't necessarily live in the community or have never spent a lot of time here. Um, but I mean, we have to accept change for what it is. And um, I did want to speak a little bit about the pandemic and um, how it shaped um, the community um, that I'm in. And um, so even though it was a very stressful, obviously, time for everybody, and it still is, um, I do feel like it did bring our community closer together in the end. Um, you know, we one of the things here at the Sheldon Center is we were losing a lot of youth and teens in our programs, um, and now we can't keep them away. So I think sometimes when things like <laughs> pandemics happen, um, people kind of, you know, they take things for granted. And then when they lose it and they don't have access to something anymore, when they get it back, they're like, OK, like, I understand like what I had and I, I want to keep it. Thanks so much, Emil, for that really thoughtful reflection. And I think I, I can certainly speak just for myself in, in this conversation, um, how you immediately took me to the places that, uh, you know, in my, in my community, in my neighborhood, uh, how we how we look to one another to sort of center ourselves in those moments, right, the pandemic being sort of um, I hesitate to say an equalizer because I think that is a fraught <laughs> statement, but I think what it does is it, is it compelled us to, to look and connect. Um, and maybe it also brought us back to the places that we do call home or that sort of live in our hearts um, as the places where we can get that support that we need. Um, I'd like to take us back at this point um, in our chat today to sort of the beginning of the project. Um, and I'll sort of invite uh, three of the originators of the idea for the project to sort of speak to this first, but really want to keep it open uh, to anybody on the call today. Um, so looking at you, Jenny, Kimber, and Dan, initially, um, how did Moving Histories come to be? And why Two Rivers, Onward Willow, and Brant? I'd love to share some of that thought process, um, both with the inside our conversation today, but also with our listeners. Dan is, is nominating you, Kimber, to get us started. 
Yes, I see that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it actually did not start with me, but it started with Nathan Lahr, um, the former uh, operations director of the Guelph Film Festival, and some conversations that he was um, having around town. Um, and, and yeah, this idea, I don't even know exactly what the original idea was, but it had to do with storytelling neighborhoods in a bus. Um, which then made Jenny um, the obvious person to connect with um, and that that started through actually I think the first like formal meeting that Nate and I took when we took over the festival in 2018 um, was to meet with you Don and Val at the museum and uh, not about this but about what we could possibly collaborate on going forward thinking I think more screenings at that time um, and Nate brought up this idea that he had floating around um, and then that really sort of kicked it off um, and then um, more formally brought uh, the storytelling community advocates and bus driver Jenny into the folds and then Jenny really um, I think dictated um, or inspired the many of the directions we went from there. Jenny do you want to talk about that in the neighborhoods that we chose? Yeah um, I, I'm laughing because the I, yeah, the original conversation came my way because I own a bus. So the first version I remember hearing about from Nathan, it was uh, Nathan and Ben Grossman, I think. Chatting. Ben doesn't remember this at all, by the no, way. Ben doesn't yeah. think he has anything to do with this, but I have told yeah. him that. <laughs> well, it was, um, they met with me at the Common, or at least Nathan did after having met Ben to talk about my bus going around. And I think it was more from the documentary side and less uh, involving a bunch of storytellers like on it. But um, from talking to them, I very quickly realized, I think from talking to the museum that they had access to the resource of using city buses and actually bringing community on the bus itself. The irony is my bus can't have very many passengers because it's, it's not registered to be moving with people. So very quickly, the main reason they brought me on board became irrelevant, but I was still able to use my bus driving knowledge to map um, bus appropriate routes through the city. And my CFRU hat, which they weren't, I don't think, considering when they brought me on, um, having spent time in a bunch of different neighborhoods. So the reason that these three neighborhoods emerged was the length of time that these three neighborhoods have kind of identified as their own kind of little communities. So they're three of the longest or oldest sort of established neighborhood groups. And Brant and Willow were two that formed um, almost, I think, as a result of being excluded from all the resources that were centered around downtown. So Two Rivers is pretty close, but the other two were quite far. And the stories I've been told were a lot of like, um, people opening the trunks of their cars or gathering around kitchen tables and being like, we can't access those resources. So what now? How do we get everything we need um, as a group? And so they were so strong and effective at that, that the, my understanding, Dan can confirm if this is true, but the neighborhood coalition was actually kind of formed, I think, initially in response to some of that work being done at a few of these different neighborhoods to try to get a conversation going across all of them. So all of the neighborhoods are amazing and have different values, but those three, the history, the sense of, I think, like identity, um, that there was that intergenerational piece, people who stick around, people who, yeah, are real lifers there and contribute in so many different ways. That then the, um, the way that the film festival tells stories with people being centered at the stories, not, um, you know, a power dynamic of someone telling you what history is, but people speaking from their own lived experience. I really trusted that those neighborhoods would have folks who could speak that way, who would be excited to tell us what their relationship was with the history of those spaces. And that seemed really important. Um, whereas maybe somewhere like downtown, we get more in those rehearsed narratives of the history of downtown and less experience of people talking about it from living there. So, um, and I think we were just really stoked to move things away from downtown because um, the museum centered downtown. So they could anchor the resources there, but spread the stories farther into places that don't normally get connected to the center. So um, that's my understanding of how that kind of organically grew. 
Um, can I jump in right now, Jenny, and just set the record straight that we were interested in you and your creative ideas and your artistry and your your the power of storytelling that you command, first and foremost, the bus was a bonus. <laughs> so, you know, when we when we realized um, that we needed to, this is my remembrance of that of that time, <laughs> when we when we realized that we needed to sort of get out frankly, from where I sit, get outside the museum, get into community in a really direct way to have um, the people who live, who, who breathe the life into the place we call Guelph in all of its diversity, in all of its corners of community. In order to get to those spaces, we needed a way to um, host and travel and move people into those spaces. And so um, it was a it was an added bonus, I'll say that uh, that you had a bus and knew how to drive it. <laughs> um, and uh, and then I think, of course, it emerged into other things very, very quickly. But I, it's it's so important that you know that. And I think you're just being modest that it was the bus that that took us to you in the first place. Um, Dan, did you want to jump in? Well, just like just like the good old fashioned um, force of story, uh, there's a million tangents to pick up on there. I mean, um, I love hearing the story of how this project generated. I my I have this neat job in in the neighborhood coalition where I'm kind of in the background supporting. So I think I probably had a few um, coffee dates with Nathan <laughs> almost before all of the story started because there was a historical piece. Um, that the Film Fest has been carrying for many years. That's a beautiful piece of the festival called Hidden Histories. It's almost like a, I mean, Kimber, please jump in and correct me, but it's almost like it's its own um, project portfolio. Hidden Histories has, has been a way for the Documentary Film Fest to have global issues in a local context, but then to also have local <laughs> issues and local people in a local context. And so the Neighborhood Coalition and the Neighborhood Groups have been part of that, that portfolio for six years and so we tried every year to dream up some way to get this beautiful skilled experienced voice of of community members into what's a wicked festival right which is a beautiful like you know national global festival and so um the only thing i would add is actually no not the only thing i would add a million things but i think i'll just observe time and say uh say um you know uh this the hidden histories um, impetus that's been going on for years um, is also part of the you know driving this specific iteration of it and mm -hmm. I think let's just make a note here while we're being recorded that it should continue we should find money and continue this um, amazing stewards and skilled people like Kavia come on board and lo loan their their super skills to people who want to become a bit more skilled in storytelling or digital arts or you know so that's it's this beautiful marriage of people with experience and skills in technical areas and people with skills and experiences in life areas and storytelling um and then let's bookmark a, a future chat and documentary about the history of the neighborhood groups as jenny alluded to because yeah that, that's another side tangent i'll just summarize by saying i think that's a great way to log the story for now but dana would want me to say that Onward Willow was kind of the original neighborhood group around 1989. A bunch of citizens came together to, to realize that community members can do things for one another in different and maybe better ways than some of the institutional and social services can do <laughs> alongside social services. And so the community spirit that created the Onward Willow neighborhood group um, caught, caught fire and caught wind. And a few years later, residents from the Brant Waverly area um, started connecting with the Onward Willow residents. And then, yes, Jenny, you're right, then it started to, to make its way around the map and the city. And there's now 15 neighborhood groups. So that's another documentary and another chat. <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> thanks, folks. Uh, my, my first response is, how much time do you have and when do we get started? Um, <laughs> but I'll shelve that for the moment. Um, thanks, too, for the segue, Dan, into sort of um, the neighborhoods and sort of the importance of the particular neighborhoods. And I, I'd love to hear from our storytellers uh, specifically. So uh, Tia, Dana, Amal, Isabella, and Michael, and of course, you too, Kavya. Um, why is it important to each of you to tell the stories of your neighborhoods? I wonder if you could offer some thoughts along those lines. 
Well, something I was thinking about recently <laughs> um, is how in a lot of neighborhoods now, there's like very strong degree of separation, like physically between everyone um, in their own individual little houses. And growing up on my street, like I was constantly running around in and out of other people's houses. I knew everyone on the street and they knew me and all the other kids. And um, walking home the other day, I walked past this kid who screamed, stranger danger, and ran away from me. And I was just thinking, you know, not only are, is it, I think, important to, to model like community connection to kids growing up and to people living in these other neighborhoods, um, because they'll be missing out on a ton of benefits of a strong community. Um, also, like <laughs> the the perceived danger of like others, strangers who are actually just your neighbors. Uh, you're raising your kids without any street smarts. <laughs> They don't know who the actual dangers are. They don't know, they don't learn how to interact with people and actually, you know, get out there and, and, and interact with others in a way that sets you up to, <laughs> to be safe actually as, as you need to, to have a home. Like we were yeah. talking about earlier, you need that sense of safety, which you're never going to get if you never learn how to find your safety in a group of other people. So yeah just modeling that to everyone i think it's so important to say that you can make safe connections with other people and not every stranger is a danger thanks so much tia and and i i love that you brought that back to safety which is what we heard from so many of you sort of an earlier on in our conversation how we define sort of the, the places we call home and the neighborhoods that we spend a lot of our time in and that we commit to in so many ways is, is really connected to our sense of safety and belonging and connection and awareness. Um, and uh, and you've, you've touched on something that's really um, sort of, I think, surfaced in, in a lot of ways, maybe in the midst of the pandemic where we were sort of forced into spaces that were separated uh, from one another and, um, you know, there has been, there are some silver linings to the journey that we've all been on and sort of learning how to live our lives and connect in, in I think, new and in interesting and important ways. But then maybe this is also sort of really crystallized um, what you've just described in that interaction you had uh, very recently in your neighborhood, um, you know, where, where clearly there was sort of this, this instinct by that person to say, no, this is unfamiliar and I, I'm fearful. Um, so how to how to move from that place into a place of home and community is uh, is is maybe somewhere in the in between those points. Stories have a major role to play. Um, Emil, um, yeah. So I think um, like why it's important for like me at least to tell my story about my community is. Um, it's a way to like show the beauty of the community for one um, to those who may not want to actually come here just yet. Um, but I think like through the documentaries and stuff like that in these podcasts, like people can um, kind of like, we can share the beauty of all of our communities um, as well as like, it's a way of advocating for our community and what they need. Um, and that like research shows that um, it only takes like one healthy adult for a child to become resilient and to be a lot more successful. And so I think through sharing our stories about our community, there might be a child who will see that and say, oh, that's where I need to be. That's where I need to go to find that one person who's going to help me become more resilient or to make better choices in life. And like that is scientifically proven. So to me, like it's all about our next generation and making sure that they're good to go. Thanks. Thanks so much, Emil. Um, Dana. Um, I, I think stories are important and, and I, um, because it, it helps to um, people to understand how the neighborhood was shaped to what it was. Um, 
and and the uh the funny part like in the actual doc we were talking about um nature boy and amel had heard about the old man in the forest and you know not to not to cross that t um so last week i was there was a young a, a young man who was having some distress so i thought let's take him out of the busy and take them over to a little bit of nature. And as we were walking through the forest, we got to the T section and I kept going and he's like, we can't go back there. There's a man living in there. And uh, I didn't want to laugh because I'm helping, you know, I'm trying to help this young man through crisis, but the story persists to this day, like 50 plus years, the story of a man living in that forest. It's amazing those 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 um, urban myths, right? Like uh, urban legends and 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 the myths. Um, and, and I think as long as we can hold on to some of those stories, um, I, I think we can keep neighborhoods um, somewhat organic on that grassroots level. Um, I'll tell you, my sister, I lived on Yorkshire when I was four and five, and my sister told me there was a monster lived up in the bushes at the top of Cork Street. And to this day, I will not walk down Cork Street at night because, you know, of that story my sister told me. So, um, yeah, um, uh, the I just think the stories make the, you know, um, no other you know i'm sure there's other urban legends in other places but onward willow has that urban legend of the man living in the forest and you know 50 years and it's still going strong so um yeah i think the the stories are what keep us grounded that's a great point um caviar um I, I'm, I'm one of the kids that grew up in that neighborhood and I heard that story and I recently have, have started working with youth at uh, Willow Road Public School and we were out there doing photography uh, in that area and all of the kids it's like they have like a like a like a like an instinct because as soon as we get to that point all of the kids just like revert turn around and go back the other way um and so it's it's really interesting the stories that we that we grew up hearing in that neighborhood and i i always think of um i i'll i'll refer to something my grandmother said about about stories and why she tells stories and and she always told us that it was because um, it, it's because she always wanted us to know where we came from. And I remember the stories that we were told um, and, and that we heard about how the community of Onward Willow came to be this community and how um, when we were at Sheldell and, you know, being, being you know, young people um, needing to complain about something, we would complain about something and someone would say like, well, like five, 10 years ago, the resources that you have we didn't have and that we worked really really hard so that you could have these resources um and and also putting a like a, giving us a responsibility of like you want more resources than work for it right because we worked for the resources that you have so it also it allowed us to have a real sense of pride of where this neighborhood came from, where the people who made this neighborhood, the work that they did, and have a real sense of like um, identity of like, this is who we are as a neighborhood. This is who we are as a community. Um, and also give us um, something that we could build from. Um, and and knowing those stories and hearing those stories and and being able to retell those stories gave us this uh like this foundation where we could build on our own story so we could add our own stories onto this um and so i think it's it's so important for us to continue to tell these stories um and that these stories um continue to be passed down to the next generation and the generation after that um so that they know like where this community came from. And I think, so they understand that the heartbeat of this community is its people um, and the stories that these people have brought into this community through the work that they've done here. Um, yeah, so I think stories are, are, are they're everything um, to a community and they're everything to our community in, in, in the Onward Willow community. I love that caveat, stories are everything. Um, Dan, you put your hand up. 
How could you not put your hand up? How could you not just jump in on this? This is getting good. I, I, um, I was thinking of Thomas King, a local writer who's a pretty amazing writer who's, who, who delivered the Massey lectures one year and said stories are, are all that we are. And, and I was thinking about some of the questions that we've been um, punting around right here, you know, like, what is a home? And like, you know, how do we make, how do we make it so that everyone can have a sense of home? And what is change? And how do you manage change? And I was thinking like, in one way, stories are a tool um, to kind of engage all of those questions. Story, sto like restoring. If story is a force and it's a force you can kind of work with, sometimes harness, you know, restoring your life and the world around you is a way to kind of engage and manage change and to invite other people in to know that restoring, you know, history making is, is something that should be available to everyone. And if all we are is stories, we got to practice it more. <laughs> we got to <laughs> practice telling stories and restoring so that you know, so that ideally everyone can feel that force, that force for creativity and change so that we can all kind of navigate these tensions without really needing to answer them, but so that we can all be a part of it. I hear you loud and clear, Jan. We have more work to do. <laughs> um, uh, Isabella and Michael, I'm so curious to hear from you in terms of what uh, you feel is, is important, what is important to you in terms of telling the story of your neighborhood? Well, I would say, first of all, that it deserves to be told, that friends, neighborhoods deserve their soul story to be told. Because as other neighborhoods, we kind of maybe get a little bit of a rap that, oh, maybe the school is not the greatest or this or that or the other, or that it's not safe. But really and truly, this neighborhood is, I don't know, maybe, maybe we should use like little mini stories to illustrate what this neighborhood is. So it's full of cultures. There's Polish, Jamaican, Afghani, um, families living in a small stretch of, uh, of our street, for example. Mm -hmm. There are folks who will look after your bunny when you're gone for a vacation because they have their bunny too, so it would be easier and more fun. If someone sees you working on your bike, they'll come over and help you fix it. Um, we, are, we are playing music on the street. We're having food on the street. We're connecting. We're learning about each other um, and that leads to safety and we're we're growing as people because we're learning about other ways of doing things other ways of observing religious holidays or i mean there are so many things that this is what we are really and truly we're good vibes and those and those deeper vibes you know not the, the, the absolute obvious but those deeper vibes are good vibes in in brand. That's what I love people to know about us. Yeah, it's good. It's, good. it's also yeah, it's good to tell your story of where you're living because that's um, you feel comfortable where you're living, right? So there's uh, maybe other people want to come live in your community, and they're hearing story, different different story. But you come and tell your story, and maybe you have the influence on them to live into the community. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what it, it, that's how good it is to tell your story where you're living. You know, yeah. it's very important. Uh, I, I love that so much. And, and Isabella and Michael, you just sort of took us to that next uh, phase of our conversation today, where I was really uh, in wanting to hear from each of you um, ab about sort of what are, you know, what you would want folks to know about the place where you live. So whomever they are, whether they're newcomers, they're, they're new residents to, to your neighborhood, or whether um, there's somebody who's, uh, you know, lives in another area of Guelph, but is visiting your neighborhood for a time, for an event, for whatever reason, um, you know, and I think what you've offered to us is that sort of like, is the restoring frankly, that Dan was referring to as well, um, that really the story of a place isn't sort of what it's not or what we're fear, what people might fear of a place. It's so many other things. And you talked about um, 
community, people, the lifeblood of the community, the people, the neighbors, the relationships, what, you know, what inspires somebody to, um, to sort of cross that threshold, walk down the drive, help somebody out who clearly is doing something that could benefit from, from a helping hand, the, you know, sharing music, sharing food, um, that's that's sort of where the stories live and I think uh, that's such a compelling picture you create um, of Brandt in particular but I know that 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 sort of story making is true of, of all of the pockets across the city we the place we call Guelph um, and I wondered if um, if I could uh, ask you Tia to also offer the same what is it about the Two Rivers neighborhood uh, that you'd like folks to know maybe folks who aren't from that neighborhood or who are new to that neighborhood or just visiting for a time, what is the, what's the, uh, the message you'd like to send to them? Well, I think Jenny was talking earlier about word history being like the most visible. And I think I noticed sometimes that it can get a little bit exclusive. I think there are some people who feel that because their lineage or just their family has resided in in the water, like the Two Rivers area, for a while. That they are the you know defining <laughs> image of like that neighborhood. Um, but I definitely agree with the restoring narrative. Um, then when you brought up Thomas King earlier, I thought that was really funny because I was also thinking about, um, I've just started reading The Inconvenient Indian and he talks about history not being like a chronology of events and facts, but just being the stories that we tell about those events and facts. So in that sense, it's, it's possible for anyone at any point in time to contribute to the history of a place or a group, neighborhood, community. Etc. So um, it's full of possibility in that sense for newcomers to be a part of that neighborhood's history. Um, and I think it's important for people to know that so that they don't feel left out of the loop, even if they're physically present in that neighborhood. Because um, I think that's the essence of it. And the nice thing is that I do think the neighborhood has been designed to facilitate um, story creation just because of the green space. I think it's a, even with maybe some of the oncoming <laughs> gentrification, there um, are a lot of, like it's a great mixed residential area with a lot of established gathering places. Um, yeah, the Huron Garden, <laughs> that's a great one. And even on my street, there's an art gallery now the new cafe and a bar. Um, there's also, I used to work at Laza Food and Beverages. Um, it's nice that it's easy for people to connect. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's important for everyone to know, whether they're new or old. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tia. Um, I think the one of the lessons we can take from what you've shared is that um, story is there. There's always more story, right? Even if we think we know a place in a certain kind of a way, there's always more to know. There's always a different way to understand and to intersect with both the histories, the present, and the future of that place. Um, and I wonder if I could um, give the last word to uh, to Dana. Emil and Kavya, um, what would uh, each of you say about Onward Willow in terms of, you know, you're welcoming folks uh, for the first time into your community. What is it you want them to know about the place you call home? Dana. There I am. Okay, I don't believe the rumors. Um spend spend a half hour in onward willow right like go see the sites go to the shelldale center stop in the onward willow center um get to know the people because that's ultimately neighborhoods are the people um and we we get such a a bad rap um at least I, that's the way i feel right it's uh even i see it every day social media it's like uh somebody will ask a question oh moving to guelph um 
what's a good neighborhood and automatically it's first well i can't tell you a good neighborhood but i can tell you what neighborhoods to avoid avoid that willow road neighborhood right so um i've stopped defending it right because i know better i'm not going to get into arguments with people who don't live in the neighborhood um but yeah just uh spend uh spend a half hour to an hour in the neighborhood meet the people you'll find out that uh we're not bad it's not a bad neighborhood we have i mean we have the same warts that every other neighborhood has right there's no neighborhood that's ex that's exclusive from petty crimes and stuff like that right so we've got no more no less than any other neighborhood so yeah um and you know what the shelldale center is not hard to find once you reach uh, on with Willow. Spend a half hour there, you probably won't want to leave. Thanks so much, Dana. Emil, did you want to offer your thoughts? Um, yeah, so um, I 100% agree with Dana. Um, I do come across a lot of um, new immigrants and just new people to the community. And um, I always tell them, like, once you're part of this community, like your family, it doesn't matter if you're here for a couple of days um, or you're here, you've been here for years, um, like you're a family. And so everyone is going to treat you accordingly. Um, and if we can't help, then we will find you what you need. Um, and it doesn't have to come from us. Like as long, we just want our um, community to be safe and healthy. Um, Another thing is, is like, it's just a beautiful, like, area. Um, I've had, with the type of um, rap, like, I guess that Dana was mentioning, like, the, that has been put on us, um, I have people come from Toronto, um, from the United States, from all over, and they cannot believe it when I tell them the stigma that has been put on this community, because they're like, this ain't you know, like, that's not like what poverty looks like where we live. That's not what um, underserved looks like where we live. And so um, I think like, um, once people are here, once they see the beauty um, of this community, um, yeah, they, they'll stay. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that you got to see to believe. Um, so like Dana said, um, you can tell someone, oh, yeah, it's a it's a good neighborhood, but it's you actually have to go to the Honor Rule Center. You actually have to go to the Sheldale Center. You could go take a tour of the schools um, in the neighborhood um, and the just, you know, the, the landscape and um, you'll see it for yourself. I love that invitation. Thanks so much, Emil. Um, Kavya, last word to you. What's special about Onward Willow? Um, I think what I, I'm not sure what more I can add, um, but I but I will say in listening to Dana and Amal and and myself speak, you might um, understand how deeply and profoundly proud we are to come from this neighborhood, um, and also to know to anyone who is who is new and coming in, um, we have newcomers coming into this neighborhood on the daily. And every couple of years, it's a new community of, of people who come into this neighborhood. Um, and so we have historically been a neighborhood that has been open to, to everyone. Um, and we welcome everyone. And, and it's, it's, it's also this sense of um, openness and willingness to be a part, uh, to really commit to being a community. Um, and it's, it's one of those neighborhoods that once you're in, they will go to bat for you. They will ride for you until the wheels fall off. Um, and it's, it's one of those neighborhoods that when you are, when you become a part of it and when you make, and it isn't, um, you don't just walk in there and say, oh, I'm going to be part of the Onward Willow neighborhood. You have to put in the work. Like, I think that's what I've learned through being a part of this neighborhood is that everyone no matter your age 
range has a place in that neighborhood and can do something to make that neighborhood better um, as the people who have come before us have done for us. Um, and so I think what I've learned from growing up in that neighborhood is that everything we have is because of the people um, in that neighborhood and how um, they have rallied for this neighborhood. And um, yeah, I can I just consider myself um, so beyond lucky to to be able to call this neighborhood my home and and to to be a part of this community and so if if I think if for for newcomers I think I would say um yeah I think in in experiencing this neighborhood I think you'll feel what what community is supposed to feel like um and that um the Onward Willow neighborhood is here we will always be here and um I think the resilience and the resistance that has always been in this neighborhood will will never never reside I think it's it's just I think if anything we're just getting warmed up um so yeah that's that's what I would say to the newcomers and and to the powers that be <laughs> we're just getting warmed up just getting started thanks so much Kavya and I said last word to you but I think last last word to Michael did you want to oh, jump in yes. Michael uh, um yeah just um look at from our neighborhood a neighborhood you guys, you guys were talking about I could say we're moving forward because I could see growth in every neighborhood over the past, over the years I've been around in Guelph. So moving forward, I would say growth and we can, each individual can make a difference in their neighborhood, you know, moving forward. You know, if you want to see change something, you have to make the change you want to see too, moving forward. So I would say that to anyone who wants to go into any neighborhood and live into it they could make a change within themselves too. What a beautiful way to uh, end our conversation today. Um, it always shocks and surprises me how quickly the time goes when we come together in these in these yeah. moments to chat. Dan's uh, showing the love. Um, can't do this. <laughs> I can't see the symbol, the, the heart symbol. So I was going to invite everybody to put their hand hearts up. Let's do it. <laughs> And hearts, y'all. <laughs> um, and if, if I could say, if our listeners, uh, uh, once once we share our conversation today uh, to the general community, um, if you could see the other conversation that's happening in the chat, that's a beautiful thing as well. There's uh, there's so much love um, on the screen here, and and more importantly, in the communities uh, across our our city. Um, I want to uh, just reiterate an invitation on behalf on behalf of everyone here to our listeners to get out and experience your city in all of its uh, variety. Uh, be curious. Uh, don't hesitate. Um, the, the neighborhoods across the city are pretty phenomenal places. Uh, be, be ready to roll up your sleeves. I think that's the other message uh, that when you go and you visit a neighborhood, um, you know, whether you're there a short time or a long time, uh, you have an opportunity. Uh, to really make a difference in those spaces. So um, big thanks everyone for joining us today in this conversation. Um, I wanna remind everyone that the, the three documentaries that this team of people, as well as many other folks across the city uh, contributed to um, are on view currently in the museum as part of the Moving Histories Neighborhood Mysteries exhibition. That exhibition continues right through the summer until September 4th. Um, I really hope and encourage you all to come out and have a look, have a listen, uh, spend some time in the space. Um, more importantly, get out of the museum, get out of your comfort zones and get out into the communities across Guelph. Um, in particular, I'd say Two Rivers, Onward Willow and and Brandt, um, they are the heart of the Moving Histories Project. So join us there. Uh, join us again also for History Bites on Wednesday, August 17th at noon. Um, that, that program is focused sort of on the, or from the vaults uh, within the museum. Uh, our visitor experiences assistant, uh, Anna Patterson, will be leading us on a journey sort of into and through the museum's collections here. And that is uh, going to be shared third Wednesday um, of August uh, the 17th. For now, thank you again. Uh, goodbye, be well, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, thanks.